I you love know. Cassie. Like Cassie truly is a dream to play. And as an actor, I'm so fortunate that I've had a character like her at such a young age. And of course I wanna, I wanna keep living her crazy. I love it. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. Hey, New York, how's it going? Yes! I'm Josh Horowitz, and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, we are live at the 92nd Street Y with the woman of the moment. It's Sydney Sweeney in the house tonight, guys. Are you ready? Um, I feel like it's Sydney Sweeney's world right now. We're all just living in it. Uh, she is killing it. Uh, I mean, since Euphoria, what was it, just five years ago, let's just run through Sydney Sweeney's amazing career. Emmy nominated for Euphoria. Emmy nominated for The White Lotus. Yes, you can cheer, yes. Uh, as you well know, she just killed it on SNL, amazing. Um, she kind of proved that rom-coms belong on the big screen again with anyone but you. And now her second producing effort in a role, her passion project is about to drop. It will disturb you in the best possible way. Immaculate is the film. Get ready. You think you're ready. You're not ready. Uh, please give a warm New York welcome to the one and only Sydney Sweeney, everybody. Here she is. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Welcome, Sid. Thanks for having me. It's so good to see you. Uh, now, I don't want to get you like get your nerves up, but Sid does. I'm have already nervous. It's okay. I was gonna say you have stage fright. I do. You just hosted SNL. You're like no, everywhere. I... What are you talking about? No, it's a thing. It's a thing. How do you deal with it? You just have to do it. Does it? Is it? Is it? I've heard that you actually like on red carpets even will like manifest like a different person. Like you have like a, like a persona that you adopt. Sometimes I have to, I'm like, okay, today we're Britney. <laughs> and what's Britney like? Who knows? <laughs> Yet on set, how are you on set? Is that just a totally oh, different vibe? Oh, I'm at home. I'm so comfy. I'm the happiest I could ever be. And was that from the start as soon as you, cause you've been doing this a, a minute now, but yeah, you found a like a home right there? It feels like my playground. I love it. So, okay, let's talk a little bit. We're going to start with Immaculate, then we're going to talk a little bit about how you got to this amazing place. Um, I tease the audience, this is, this is a crazy movie, and you want a crazy horror movie every once in a while. Uh, and it is a passion project. Um, you were in a much, much different part of your career when this first came around. Uh, you auditioned for this how long ago? I auditioned for it when I was 16. Yeah, ooh. <laughs> oh. And I remember sitting in the car with my mom. She drove me to the audition, and we're running the lines. And I was so nervous because I loved it so much. And I went into the audition, and the casting uh, assistant was there, and they read with me. And I got my first call back. I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> but then it never happened, and the movie just disappeared. And I just kept thinking about it. Like every year randomly, I would dream up scenes. I was on set of The Handmaid's Tale and, thank you. Yes. <laughs> and I saw how active Elizabeth Moss was on set as a producer, as a creative, and I was so inspired. But then I also started dreaming up how I'd want to shoot Immaculate. And I was like, why am I thinking about Immaculate? Like, not, oh, how many, four years later. It was crazy. So, I emailed my agents and I said, can you guys figure out if Immaculate ever got made? And I didn't. So I was like, I know this is crazy, but I want to make it myself. And I got a hold of a writer, Andrew LaBelle, and I just convinced him to let me take his script and turn it into what you see now. I, mean, I have to say, it's, it's amazing to me because so many people in your position, like when something like Euphoria happens, like if you look at the last few years for you, you've really steered the ship. Like you haven't, you could have ridden just like the wave and just taken the best parts that come and that's totally fine. 99% of actors do that. But for whatever reason, I mean, it's a great reason, I guess, you wanted to have some control. That and also I feel like I have to constantly prove myself. I mean, I've yeah. gone from 
Sharp Objects and Handmaid's Tale and Euphoria and White Lotus and all these incredible characters and all these incredible projects, but then, I mean, still people are like, eh, can she act? <laughs> well, and I would imagine also, and we'll get to this, but part of it is also the struggle is underneath. Like, you went through years, you've been doing this a while. Yeah, I started when I was like 10, 11 years old, and it wasn't until Euphoria and I was 21 that it was like actually more tangible. And that must inspire you, like even though it's seemingly, oh, Sydney Sweeney can do kind of anything she wants now, you still remember, it's oh, palpable. I, you have to fight for the good roles. The roles that are challenging, are creatively fulfilling, are usually the ones that you have to fight for. Right. Yeah. And this one, Immaculate actually, as much as you love the concept, a lot changed. So much changed. So setting changed, the age of the of protagonist the Cecilia changed. Yeah. Well, Originally, why, yeah. it was set in a all-girls boarding school in Ireland. And when I got my hands on the script, I knew that I needed to update it because I wasn't 16 anymore. And so I started playing with ideas, and then I brought Dave Bernard, our producer, on, who also produced White Lotus. And I then texted Michael Mohan, our director, who I worked with on Voyeurs and Everything Sucks. And I said, hey, do you want to do a horror film? And I sent him the script, and within... 24 hours, he sent me this incredible visual pitch deck. It's like 20, 30 pages of all of, the, all of his ideas of how he would update the script, how he visually would shoot it, references, and it was exactly how I saw it in my mind. And he's the one who actually brought the ending as an idea. We'll tease that. We're not going to ruin it, don't worry. But the ending, yeah. <laughs> but talk to me a little bit about that, because that I find fascinating. So Michael Mohan, who was really instrumental in an early part of your career, that, yeah. that early show. Everything was Sucks. It was my first ever um, big role on a TV show. So, so the surrealness of it, the satisfaction of going back to a director that saw something in you early on and saying, hey, I've got a potential job for you. That must be amazing. Oh, I love it. You build such incredible relationships on set, and then after working together for like two, three, four months, you move on, right. and you hope that you get to see these people again. And I've been so lucky to be able to do now three projects with Mike. Yeah. And he also uses a lot of the same keys, so like our DP, Elijah Christian, he was also Everything Sucks, and also Voyeurs, our uh, production designer, Adam Reamer, like he uses the same team, and Mike and Elijah were college roommates, and I'm a very loyal person too. I think it's super important in this industry, so I feel like I had my family around me. When you kind of allude to this, I think one of the things that people, I appreciate at horror is when done right, like you can really lean in and like pay great attention to detail. The sumptuous design of this, the setting, it feels like you can kind of like do like, you know, down and dirty horror, or you can do kind of like this like really gorgeous, um, Kind of a throwback more to the 70s. It, a lot of Mike's uh, references were 70 infused. Yeah. Uh, and you've seen this, I assume, by now with some audiences. There must be su such a satisfying feeling because this is an audience movie. It's amazing. We premiered it at South by Southwest, and it was so exciting feeling everybody's just their excitement in the room when they screamed and then they started laughing at themselves because they were screaming. Uh, they were cheering. It was, it was great. Uh, a slightly different wardrobe than you've had for other films in this Just one. Just a little. Just so a little. <laughs> what, I mean, what does that, I mean, that must put you into a, a different mindset immediately. It does. It actually, I love whenever a character has a transformative experience through her clothing. And for Cecilia, putting on the garments, like it definitely, definitely switched me over. Uh, I love that as a producer, you, you used your power for good by employing some of your family members <laughs> in the film. I did, I How, did. Who, who's, in, who's in the movie? My grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my grandmas. They're so sweet. So what's cool, my nana, so that's my dad's mom, is actually an extra in every single one of Mike and I's projects together. And then I brought my grandy, too. I have fun names for them. But... Um, <laughs> It was their dream to go to Italy, and their dream to, they've never really gone to Europe before. So for Christmas, I surprised them, and I told them that they're gonna come to Italy and see me at work, 
and I and got this them. Nice sweet movie. This yeah. Like, yeah. Oh no, you, you guys. I didn't tell them what the movie was. <laughs> you have a history of this, though. I feel like when Euphoria premiered, no one I really do. knew what they were getting well, into, right? I grew up. I grew up in a smaller town, so like movies and TV shows aren't really their main thing. They're outside. Sure. So they don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I brought my grandmas to the premiere last week. And my grandie, literally, she leans over and she looks at me in the aisle and she goes, oh my God, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. I love it. I love yeah. it. And I know that horror, like this genre is important coming through your dad, right? Growing up. It does. My dad loves horror films. So has he reviewed it? Has he seen it yet? He did. He saw it that night too. So what? What? You don't come from a family of, of a showbiz family, to say the least. No, so far removed. So what do they? How are they with the fame thing? Like, have they embarrassed you at parties? Have they gone up to celebrities? They have no idea. They don't my, care. My parents don't have social media. They just kind of have like no clue. My dad will randomly call me. I had to teach him how to put his phone on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> and he gets like a hundred calls while he's sleeping. And he was like, they're asking for you. Should I, uh, should I give them your number? I'm like, no, dad, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> he has zero clue. Do they, do any family members try to steer you in like any kind of career direction? Are they like, you know, we could do, a, do like a Pixar movie or do like a, something without blood or sex maybe in the next one? Um, no. No? No, they do question, like, so what's your next one? Can we watch it? Right. <laughs> How awkward will the next one be for me to watch, yeah, basically? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what are your, now, now being a horror aficionado, having made a, a great horror movie in your own right, what are the things you love or, or don't love in horror? Like, what are, where do your tastes run? Ooh, you said you like, like a jump a scare. Yeah. yeah, I love, I, I love a little bit of everything, but the one thing that I... It's not that I don't like, but I, I enjoy the most is when you, it's the fear of the unknown. Right. Like when someone is walking down a hallway and you're just absolutely terrified of anything that could jump out at any moment. I sometimes don't like showing what the character might be scared of. Yeah, it's the anticipation. Yeah. Um, okay, let's tease around the ending without saying the ending. Okay. Um, it's an intense ending, guys, <laughs> and you delivered an amazing performance throughout, but especially the ending Thank is like you. an acting feat. Thank you. Um, what went into it? Can, again, this is cruel, I know, but like, uh, it, it, oh. it, was, it was a taxing scene, to say the least, yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you guys... When when you guys see it, yeah, you well, guys all better we're all going to reassemble it. a week from today, and we're going to talk it through. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um. So, how do I? Ex so we can say it, it, it involves I will, blood. You, it, it involves a lot of blood, and that was the first take that you see. So it's one long take. I want to say it's like two and a half minutes, maybe, and. We set up the cameras. We were in a rush that day. And we just like blocked out where I'd start, go, come back. And Mike, our director, was like, do you want to rehearse it? Do you want to go through anything? I was like, no, let's just, let's just see what happens. And then there it is. what you guys see is what happens. Is it true? I read somewhere that like some blood got in your eye and you were just like, keep going, basically? Um, so that is journalists that get things wrong, huh? What? Um, is that the record what? straight? Uh, that is the scene prior okay. when blood gets, like, okay. There's blood how do I couple, say things without, the yeah. <laughs> but then during that, I just knew what the reset time would be. Right. So I was like, we don't have time for this. I'm just going to keep going. And I remember yelling at Mike. I was like, don't fucking stop. <laughs> <laughs> I love there was like, you posted, I think, like a little video in your stories the other day of you in like full blood drenched <laughs> makeup. Yes but kind of out of character. Like, you can turn it on and off. Like, you're not, like, that person that just stays in it. No, it's... I, I like to separate myself from my characters as much as possible. So when they call action, Sydney's gone, and then when they call cut, I'm back. This is probably good for the psyche and the mental well-being. I know, but I was, I was having press the other day, and the journalist was like, you know what this is called, right? I said, what? He goes, possession. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, man. Uh, something to think about. <laughs> you know when you're at a family gathering and you feel the need to bend the truth to impress a loved one, an aunt, an uncle? Yeah, the job's going great. Yeah, the relationship's going great. You're bending the truth just to make it all more comfortable. That should not be the situation in your doctor's office, guys. You should not have to feel like you are cutting any corners. That's why our sponsor, ZocDoc, is so important. This is the place where you can find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable and actually listen to you. And we're not talking about just a few doctors. They have tens of thousands of doctors with verified patient reviews so you can make sure the vibes are all great and you're always comfortable with that very important person in your life. Yes, your doctor. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. Plus, you can search by location, availability, and insurance. So there are literally no compromises here because with ZocDoc, you've got all the options at your fingertips. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly, instantly book appointments with them online. If I needed a doctor, ZocDoc would be there for me. Go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad, download the ZocDoc app for free, then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. Let's go back a little bit. So uh, growing up, as I alluded to, Spokane, no showbiz in the family. How did, the, how did your parents know this wasn't just a phase? Like this, it wasn't gonna be like acting one week, gymnastics the next, this is for real. This was like- Soccer. Sorry. <laughs> I, no, literally I was on a soccer team. I was on a snow ski team. I wakeboarded. Um, I was on a softball team. I was on every sport you could think of. I loved it. And. <laughs> what position? Uh, soccer. I was forward. Of course, um, but but they but there was something different about the passion for acting. They saw that you felt that. Yeah, I um, I just had a crazy imagination. Yeah, I would build imaginary worlds and characters, and I would put on little performances for my grandparents and my parents growing up. And they thought that it was like wanting to be a princess. They were like, this is not real, she'll grow out of it. And then this really small indie movie came to town and I found out about it. And so I put together a five year business plan presentation at 10 years old <laughs> of what could happen if they let me audition for this movie because they weren't taking me seriously. So I was like, I'm gonna talk to these people like adults. It's, so there are two young actors that I know that I've talked to over the years that have basically taken that tactic. And the PowerPoint at a very young age, you and Emma Stone. Emma Stone did that too. Do you know that story? No. Yeah. You're, <gasps> you're in good company. Oh my God, I love Emma Stone. <laughs> she did the whole PowerPoint. How did you even know how to do PowerPoint at 10? Because my, my dad would question. do a lot of them. My dad was a pharmaceutical rep, and so he'd put together little things, and my mom would help him. So it's not an overnight success story after that, though, as we alluded to. No, it took 10 years. But, and I, I've heard you talk about this. It's a long trip from Spokane to LA. It's a very long trip. It's 18, 19 hours in the car. Yeah. So when you think about that, I mean, it's, it's kind of moving to, it's more than kind of, it's very moving to think of like the family sacrifice and kind of doubling down on your passion to say, yeah. It's incredible. Like I am so grateful for my parents because they they truly did sacrifice so much and they believed in me before anyone else believed in me. And I, I owe everything to them. I would not be able to do any of this without their support of just, I mean, you guys, they would drive me after school. I would get out of school and then I would get in the car and drive all the way to LA, sleep in the car, go to an audition and then drive all the way back so I can make school the next day. And like, that's some amazing parents. And what, were, what was your life like back at school? Because these years are going by and they see you going back and forth. And that was hard. Right, because you're not, they're not seeing, all, I mean, they're seeing these little spots, but you're probably, I mean, that must hurt your, your it, pride and everything. It was, like, well, when you're, I was so young and you're already dealing with growing up and being awkward. And 
when you leave a small town and you're doing something new and different, a lot of people don't understand that. And so I found that I dealt with, I, I dealt with a lot of bullying, but it came from the parents as well. And like the parents talking to the kids and like not understanding like how dare they like leave this town? How like how could they uproot their family like this? And so that was really hard to deal with. And I ended up like after a year and a half of going back and forth and trying to stay in school back home, my mom ended up pulling me out and homeschooling because it just it got really bad. What was like what was the dream role at 12, at 15, at 17? Like, what were you shooting for? What were you dreaming of at those ages? Crazy roles. <laughs> no, like, Silence of the Lambs. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> the Shining, but I wanted, like, I, I, I wanted to be the monster. Like, <laughs> I was dreaming of crazy characters. Wow. Okay, so it's inevitable. This was, this was a long time coming. Yeah. Um, Sharp Objects was a big one, correct? It was, it was. Uh, this was, for those that don't remember, this is Amy Adams. Mm -hmm. This is the late, great Jean-Marc Vallée, uh, who also did Big Little Liars, a lot of great movies. And I've heard so many actors just like love working with He him. was incredible. So is that a game changer to work with a, not only a great director, but a director that, you know, it sounds cliche, but it's true, sees you, like sees Completely. what Completely, no, Jean-Marc, he, he was so influential in my entire life and, and my career because it started from just the audition process. Like Jean-Marc is so, he was so thoughtful and caring towards his actors. And you can always tell that by like the casting process and the casting director that he, he likes to use, his name is David. And he was one of the first people who actually like did the audition with me. I mean, I'd been in so many auditions where they wouldn't look up. They were eating chips while I was doing my audition. They'd answer a phone call in the middle of it. And I just never felt like anybody cared when I walked in a room. And he actually like did the scene with me, mem had his lines memorized, had props. And I felt like I was, even though it was an audition, I was, I was in this dream that I always had of being an actor. And I got to actually be that character. And then I got a call back and I got to meet Jean-Marc and he was the exact same way. And he just like, he would sit with you and, and want to work on the, the scene with you. And it wasn't like he was sitting behind a table and taking notes. Like he would come and sit right here and, and start talking about the character and the lines and the scenes. And I remember walking out of that callback and I called my mom and I was like, even if I don't get this, this, like, this was everything for me. Like this was the first time that I actually felt like this is my dream. Like these are the people I want to work with and ended up getting it. And it was just like two episodes, but I loved being on set so much that Jean-Marc ended up putting me in every episode. And even if it was just a, like a flash, just so I could come and be on set and learn because I would sit at Video Village and his producing partner, Nathan Ross, who I work with now, uh, they were so welcoming and I would sit in during their lunch production meetings and just learn as much as I possibly could. It was amazing. Well, he must have been hardened to see. I mean, I think he was with us, I'm sure, when Euphoria had come around to see, like, somebody took a shot on to bear that fruit. That's amazing. Yeah, he's, he's incredible. Well, he's um, and, and look, now we're getting into like the really good stuff and like it gets, it's, it's just amazing to see what, what happens in the, in the last five years. Um, you pop up in Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, one of the all-time classics for, I mean, truly. That was crazy. Crazy. Um, and talk about a fascinating experience. I mean, the stories of how Quentin runs his sets are infamous, no cell phones. No cell phones. He just loves it. He, he lives and breathes movies. You're in that world completely. So you're, you're sharing space with like Margaret Qualley, but you're also sharing space with Brad Pitt and you're on the Spawn Ranch, you're in that sequence. Um, again, where's the, where, the, where are the nerves on, on, on those days? When I'm on set, there's you're no okay. nerves. Yeah. I'm, I'm so free and happy. I love it. So, and when you, 
yeah, that's, I guess, living the dream because you're like, you're, I mean, yeah, cause that's what I dreamt of when I was little. I had no idea any of this came along with acting <laughs> like zero clue. I, yeah. I didn't have a phone until I was 13, 14. Social media wasn't really an important thing to me. The dream was being on set and playing all these characters. Honestly, if someone told me that I'd be on stages, talk shows, speaking, I'd be like, oh, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> what are the do's and don'ts for you in social media at this point? Because you've been through it like any young actor. Like, it's, it's rough out there, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you talk about bullying. I mean, you've been through it. Um, how do you stay sane, stay safe, feel like you're in control on social media? Um, I just... I, I mix up what I put out there. Like, of course, I want to share the work that I'm doing because that's what I'm really passionate about. But then I like to sprinkle in a little bit of Sid here and there so that people can see right. me Yeah. as much as you guys can. Sure. It's hard. It's all hard. Well, so then we get, of course, to Euphoria, um, which totally changes the game. Um, was it just another audition or did it feel like, was there a buzz around what Euphoria could be by the time it came around to you or was it just like another next, let's see what happens kind of a thing? No, you know, it was, no one really knew what it was going to be and I didn't even get to go into the room. Like I couldn't get into the room to audition. So I put myself on tape and sent it in and then I booked it off the tape. There's so much like lore about like how that set is and how Sam runs the set and like what the nature of it. There, it's like I feel like there's a lot of mystique around it. What what would you say is different and unique about Euphoria compared to the other sets that you've been on? What makes it special? There's a lot of reasons that it's special. I mean, we're doing and playing characters that have meant so much to people, and. It's the longest production that I've ever been on because each season takes like eight to 10 months to film. So I'm getting to be with this group of people for a longer amount of time than I'm used to and actually build like right relationships and, and have almost like a family in a way. Like Maude and I are best friends. She feels like my actual sister. And I'm so thankful to be able to have something like that in this industry. It must be so amazing to go through something like that with Maud. And I know we were we were joking about like musical theater the other day. She's doing cabaret and Little Shop here. She I did. Flew, I flew to London and I watched her, and then I came here and I watched her do um, Little Shop of Horrors. I was so proud of her. But it must be exciting to see like where everybody. Look, Zendaya was already doing amazing things, but to see like Jacob Elordi, like Saltburn was the thing for a few months, like obsessed by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> did you see Saltburn? <laughs> I was going to ask a, a funny question and then I decided not to. Oh, wow. Restraint. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Saltburn, another one that sticks with you, just like, like Immaculate. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe for different reasons. Different reasons. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Um, but yeah, to like go through like with peers and to sort of see what everybody has been doing. Um, I'm just so proud of everybody. Yeah. Everybody's living their dreams and they're working really hard. Um, You've been through two seasons on Euphoria. Do you feel like you also, the collaborative nature of that production, were able, have been able to kind of suggest things for Cassie that you do or don't want to see, or you do kind of feel you leave yourself to Sam's writing? It's a bit of both. I mean, I think that we've all lived with our characters for so long, so we have a bit more of an agency behind. We feel like maybe she'll say this, but... It's, it's truly just like a collaboration the entire way. I had a few choices on clips. Forgive me, I went with an obvious one. I'm going with the meltdown. I'm going with the, the bathroom scene. Oh, Euphoria? Yeah. You ready? How many times have you seen this clip? One, um, I don't know. Oh, okay. You don't have to watch it. We'll watch it. Okay. Okay? Here's a clip from Euphoria. <laughs> Cassie in action. I'm never going to be able to live that down. <laughs> I mean, iconic, truly. Do you remember what it was like? You didn't know at the time what that was going to be. No, you guys, that was the first day, first scene back for season two. Do you feel like out on a limb when you're, when you're doing a scene like that? Like, oh my God. Yeah, you fully just have to go for it. You have to trust everybody around you and just whatever happens, happens. A lot I happens. When I, I remember watching it back, I was watching it live with all of you. Uh... I was like, when did I do that? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you blacked out, it never happened. 
Um, and you've seen, I mean, obviously, it's been memed to death. You, Brian Cox recreated it. I know. He did a pretty good job. It's pretty good. Not, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. You know, there's only one, Cassie. Um, I know you can't say anything, but the hope, it's been a while. It's been a minute since you guys have been on set shooting. Have, like, the fans have been concerned because there have been rumors like, is it even going to ever come back? Have you as an actor been, ever had that concern like, are we coming back? Are we doing more Euphoria? <laughs> it's a curious time to get thirsty. What just happened? <laughs> are you anxious and excited? It's been, what, probably three years since you've been on set. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How much anticipation from a scale of one to ten do you feel about getting back on set to play Cassie again? <laughs> what just happened? You were talkative. We were having fun. I know, I know. Honestly, it's, it's like as scary as talking about Marvel, guys. <laughs> Do you I want me to ask well, about I Madame Webb instead? I said one thing and then it like went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, we're excited. I'm excited too. I love Cassie. Like Cassie truly is a dream to play. And as an actor, I'm so fortunate that I've had a character like her at such a young age. And of course, I want to I wanna keep living her crazy. I love it. Have you been continually writing in the, we haven't even mentioned like these books that you create to like really get into character, these like exhaustive background books that you truly write. So are you continually adding to Cassie even in like the downtime or are you? No, I wait to see what happens. And then I'm like, all right, how did she get there? <laughs> Happy Sad Confused is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you sleep a little more? Would you visit a friend? Would you read a book? Most of us spend our lives thinking about having extra time, but the real question, the real question we should be asking ourselves is time for what? What would you use if you had unlimited time? Therapy can help decide what to use that time for, what's important in your life. I've benefited from therapy, friends have too. If you're looking to start therapy, BetterHelp is there for you. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your busy schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Plus, they have flexibility. Think about that. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Therapy is invaluable in these stressful times. Give BetterHelp a try. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's right. BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash HSC. Give therapy a try. Oh, my God. Time's flying by. Let's mention a few other amazing things. Of course, White Lotus. Um, yes. Just so you know, every uh, gig does not become a giant pop culture phenomenon. This is unusual, Sydney. This is the weird, this is weird. Um, I mean, that experience, again, Mike White, for those in the know, like, he's always been an amazing writer. He's incredible. Fascinating. But it also came at a very strange, unique time. Did making White Lotus in the thick of the pandemic kind of save you, kind of like help you kind of like get through that crazy time? Yeah, I mean, I am a workaholic, yeah. so I was just so fortunate to be able to have work during such a hard time, but it was, it was honestly a dream. Like, being able to work with Mike White and Jennifer Coolidge and Connie Britton and everybody that was involved in the project and be in Hawaii, and <laughs> it's like, this is really nice. You said, you said the character scared you. Do you mean the character itself or playing the character or The both? character itself. I mean, Olivia is terrifying. <laughs> I modeled her off of a lot of people I'm scared of in life. Um, but again, that must have just caught you off guard to see how that, that I mean, shows like that don't generally become phenomenons, but it, it for whatever reason, truly clicked. I guess it's the specificity of his writing. He, he writes really human, relatable, odd characters. Mike's very in touch with... Uh with people and society and yeah. he's just smart. He's a smart writer. 
um, more smart writing, and this is a swerve, to work on something uh, like reality must have been so satisfying. I don't know if you guys have checked out reality. If you haven't, you really should. Um, this is a, an amazing performance, reality winner. Um, this, this woman who is interrogated, this is essentially a transcript. This is- It is, it's, it's the actual transcript from the FBI interrogation when two FBI agents go to reality winner's house and it's the real, like the actual transcript. All of our dialogue is pulled from that. So talk about like, you know, you go from sets where it's, you know, a bit collaborative, et cetera, and then you're 16 days, tons of dialogue. Does that feel like achievement unlocked? Like I can work within these kind of tight confines and still find my way into a character? It was a huge challenge for me. Yeah. I think reality is one of the most, um, like, like when I say I like to do characters that scare me and it's because that means it's gonna be a challenge. It's going to challenge me as an artist in new ways and that is what I should be doing. So reality scared me because I'd never done anything like that before. I mean, we're filming like 20 pages a day and it's just pure dialogue and I had to make sure I had every single word correct. Um, and everything was so close and tight and I was telling someone's true story. And so I felt the weight of that. And it was a lot, it, it, was, it was a different type of process yep. than I've ever had before. Um, but it was, it turned out, I mean, I'm very proud of it. No, you should be. And again, like these swerves are amazing, but like, you know, it's underestimated how tough it is to lead a romantic comedy. Um, but anyone but you just is so satisfying and fun. And must feel you produced this one as well. So this is again, you hire the director, you get Glenn involved. Like this, Cindy really made this one happen. Um, thank, you, thank you. Why, again, was that just the challenge of it? You grew up with these films and like, why aren't they being put on the big screen anymore? Yeah, I love rom-coms. I'm like, I'm, I'm such a sap for love. And I, I was missing like those early, oh. <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh my God, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I, 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 I love like early 2000 rom-coms, like the ones that they felt so big and they made you want to fall in love after watching it. And I just didn't know why people weren't really making big rom-coms anymore. Well, and I have to, to, I have, to do. they are, and I have to <laughs> thank Will because Will, our director, Will once, yep. uh, once I brought him on, he brought in a few ideas that really made the rom-com feel bigger. And he had like the helicopter ideas and, and we changed it from Italy to Australia because of him. And I have to thank him for a lot of that. This is kind of like an insider businessy thing, but like the movie opened and the first weekend it opened in fourth place and it didn't, it didn't make a ton of money. Cut to $215 million and, and growing still at the box office. Like this is a very unusual circumstance. But I have to thank you guys for that because none of that would be possible without the fans, the audience, and people showing up to theaters and actually showing people what they want to see. And I think that it's really important to show the industry and also show critics that you guys like stuff that they might not like. Yeah. First, as much as the box office and movies are dominated by sequels, rom-coms don't often get sequels, but people want to see you and Glenn together again. And I know you guys are talking. Do you th is, your, is your gut say it's a sequel, that it's the same characters, or are you just you and Glenn in a different rom-com? Uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, is that part of the debate right now, kind of? There's like, so much discussion around all of it. Yeah, I would imagine, again, $215 million makes people anxious to Yeah, there's just a talk. few people that want to do some movies together. Yeah, yeah. What is, look, on a different side, and they all can't make ginormous gobs of money, what is the learning of something like Madam Web, which you, you're not a producer on, and not, you know. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Love for everything, it's all good. But what do you take, wait, what? There you go. Okay. What do you, what do you, they should use that in some quotes. Yeah. Put it on the DVD. What's, uh, 
What, what is the learning of an experience like that? What What's do you take the learning away? of yeah, the Yeah, what do you take away from that? Um, well, I'd, I want to like point out and s the, the timeline of projects and explain a few things. So, don't laugh at that. Guys, <laughs> come on. Madam Web is my first ever studio project, studio film that I ever got cast in. And I am so thankful to Sony because it was such a building block for me. And while I was filming that, I was actually building the packages for both Immaculate and Anyone But You. And I then took Anyone But You out once I put the whole package together and put the pitch together. And I called up Sony and I said, hey, I have this movie. We're filming together. Let's build a relationship. And that's how Anyone But You got made. And I would never have been able to do that without Madam Web. Yeah. And it, look, to be honest, there's... And also, my, my cousins could watch the movie. You know, I get it. On paper, no problem. All good. It happens. It's just, I mean, and, and this is the difference, honestly, between being an actor for hire, as you've mentioned, and having some skin in the game. And yeah, and it's so hard not being able to, like, be fully involved. But yeah. I was That's an nice. actor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Sony, Sony likes you, fair to say, at this point. They're happy with you. Um, talk to me a little bit about, like, what do, you, what do you get offered? You're obviously willing a lot of these things into existence yourself. You have a, this production company is just, and these are only the ones that have been produced. I know you're, you've got a lot of things in development. I do, I have a lot. So is there a typical role you get? Do you kind of roll your eyes at like a certain type of character you're getting or are you getting um, interesting material? It's interesting. It comes in waves of whatever project is coming out. So there's a lot of rom-coms. Um, there's a lot of dramas. It's, it's, but I always find that the ones that I want are not the ones I'm getting offered. They're the ones that I have to fight for. And they're the ones that I have to either make myself. Well, again, to your point, like you're zigging, zigging and zagging everywhere. So if they're only going to offer you what you just did, you're never going to do no, two in fun. a row. Yeah, it's not fun at all. Um, you have some really cool things that you just shot, actually. So you worked with Ron Howard. I did. You just, that's the most recent one, right? That was the most recent one. I went back to Australia and I got to work with him and Jude Law and Anna de Armas and Daniel Brohl and Vanessa Kirby. Such an amazing cast. I was pinching myself the entire time. Um, I can't really say much about it. It's based on a true story. It's crazy. But it's a very different character than I've ever played. And that's what I love. I love finding characters that throw you guys off. It's like, wait, what? That's her? I mean, talk about different kind of characters. Are you still developing Barbarella? Is Barbarella something that you want to do? It is. I mean... That's a big swing. That movie, for yes. those that has, have never seen the original, like, iconic. For, have to. It's so good. It's wild. It's so campy. Love it. <laughs> so what do you see in that that excites you? Because you're obviously going to have to give it a different spin. The gender politics are going to be way different, obviously, where we're at today. Um, but what are the seeds of that, that that made you so excited to try and develop this into a new film? I mean, Barbarella is just such a fun character to explore. Yeah. Like, she really just embraces her femininity and her sexuality. And I love that. Like, she uses sex as a weapon. And I think it's just such an interesting way into a sci-fi world. And I've always wanted to do sci-fi. So we'll see what happens. One director that's been mentioned for that is one of my favorites. And you were just photographed with him, I think, at a premiere, Edgar Wright. Is he someone you'd like to see? Direct Barbarella, is he the one? Oh, she's thirsty again. <laughs> what just happened? Wait, you're parched. Are you okay? Actually, yeah, I was really thirsty there. <laughs> so no director yet, but Edgar's become an acquaintance? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's do some questions from the audience. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, well, we, we covered this a little bit, but let's see if we can find a new spin in. This is from Sarah. What made you so interested about this story, namely Immaculate, that made you want to produce it years after originally auditioning for it? Yeah, why do you think it's kept sticking with you all these years? I think because a lot of the fear and the terror and the horror comes from a place of realism, where in a lot of films, 
you're trying to run away from something and, and you can escape it. Whereas Cecilia, one, she is trapped in this convent, but then also the thing that terrifies her the most and the thing that's torturing her the most is growing inside her. And so she can't outrun it. This is from Kayla. What was the hardest part of filming this movie compared to your other movies? Mm. The hardest part? Is it the physical aspect? Is it, I mean, she goes on quite the emotional journey in this, clearly. Yeah, but that stuff's fun. Like, the hard stuff is when you're, like, cold and hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good answer. Uh, Matt wants to know what's been the most fulfilling thing about creating your own production company. I mean, especially now that these things are actually coming out. It must be to see. Yeah, seeing everybody's reactions to the projects, but then also the relationships that I'm building. I'm getting to learn so much more about this industry, and it's not just, like, my fellow actors. Like, I am understanding and gaining respect for all aspects. The the grip, the, cr like, transpo, like, everybody that has a part of making a project come to fruition because it's not possible with everybody. Like you have to have, you have to have every single crew member like there and happy and, and working hard. And so I just respect so much of what they do. And I love being able to learn and, and just build those relationships. I, I know an important part about, especially the Euphoria experience has been how it's connected with young audiences, right? And like the reaction you get from folks like these or on the street must be amazing. And I've heard you also say, like any actor, you don't like necessarily enjoy being compared to other actors, right? And then the irony is, of course, so many young people probably compare themselves to you because you are now such a, you know, a big force in the, in the entertainment they see. That's crazy. I mean, what do you, <laughs> it's real. I mean, like, what, what would you say to somebody that, compares themselves to you, that it sees you as someone they aspire to be? Everybody is on their own journey. And you don't want to compare your path to anybody else because I have this thing where I've always said that I look up to the older version of myself. So I'm hoping that the decisions that I'm making now make 40-year-old Sydney proud and happy. And I've always thought that that's like really important because I'm not doing this for, I'm not trying to like follow any other person's path. I'm like, I'm hoping that whatever I do can fulfill me as much as possible and then spread as much good too. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, we're gonna end on a much more frivolous note with a happy sick confused, uh, profoundly random questions. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Dogs or cats, Sydney? Dogs. Big dog, do my, dog dad My dad here. and my little brother were allergic to cats, so I didn't really grow up with cats. Tell me about Tank. Is Tank the dog? Tank's my best friend. What kind of dog is Tank? I rescued Tank when I was 17. Um, I brought her home and my parents got really mad. <laughs> but now my mom wants her all the time, so. She is my everything. She's, my, she's truly just, she's made my life so much better. Uh, what do you collect, if anything? I collect tiles. Like? So like hand paint, <laughs> he's so confused. <laughs> you guys are all confused. <laughs> Trust me, everyone's confused when, so whenever I travel, I like to try and find hand painted tiles of whatever city I'm in, because I want to collect them and make like a big, huge wall. And so at the end of wherever I am, whatever country I'm in, I was like, okay, we gotta find a tile. And it's the hardest thing to find, which I like, cause it's a challenge. <laughs> Sydney likes challenges. Uh, Harry Potter or the Rings? Harry Potter. You grew, you grew up Harry Potter. I grew up with Harry Potter, so yeah. I feel like that's my generation. Books or the films, both? Everything? Um, both, but the films were just so good. Yeah. My brother would carry around like every book to dinner and read them all at the same time. He'd have like three books and he'd read one page and one, flip it, next page and the other. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to do it. Yeah. Um, I think I know the answer to this. Would you ever skydive? Yes, Yeah. of course. You're like so for my 18th birthday, I got my mom and I, I, I saved up a lot of my money and I got a skydiving, but then I booked 
sharp objects and in the freaking thing that you have to sign that you're not allowed to <laughs> skydive. And so I've never skydived because I haven't like not signed one of those papers right. every year since then. So yeah, you have to stop working for a minute and mm -hmm. then you can risk your life. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Still things to do. Uh, last actor you were mistaken for? Last what? Actor you were mistaken for. It's one response. Ow? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I get a lot of, you look a lot like the girl from Euphoria, and I'm like, really? Huh. I hear she's good. <laughs> <laughs> like that bitch. <laughs> Not that there's anything annoying about you, but what would friends and family say is the most annoying thing about Sydney Sweeney? Um, probably that I am such a workaholic. That I don't, I don't slow down, and I need to. I need, I need to like take time to be with my friends, my family. But I just, I love what I do. Yeah. I love it so much. What's your go-to karaoke song? Uh, something Unwritten. unwritten, of course. <laughs> That's the politically correct answer. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be so funny. "Creep" by Radiohead. Sure. <laughs> wow. You want to do it a cappella right now? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> you commit, I bet. Nah. I'm not saying you have to do it now, but you commit in karaoke, you like have everything to. else, right? Yeah. What's the worst note a director has ever given you? <laughs> you don't have to name names, just. <laughs> or you can name names, actually. Pass. Oh, okay. Uh, in the spirit of happy, sad, confused, an actor that always makes you happy. You see them on screen. I'm in for a good time. The Property Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I love HGTV. <laughs> Some of our finest thespians, the Property Brothers. <laughs> the Property Brothers. <laughs> Are they considered actors? I mean, I mean, they're probably in SAG. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to the letter of the law, sure. Um, a movie that makes you sad. Titanic, oh. but then also makes me want to fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> was that your idea to get that into anyone but you? That must have been a moment. I was like, Will, I love Titanic so much. We got to get it in there. Yeah, and he put it in there for me, and I was so happy and so excited. But Joe's line of um, when we go over and he goes, ah, oh, looks like they went full Titanic. <laughs> that was all Joe. He is so funny. He's so <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> your buddy from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm sure Leo, did Leo text you afterwards like you did it? You killed it? No. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but I can't. Can't even. Can't even. I mean, there's still some actors, the ones we grew up with that are still like, how can yeah. I share space with that human being, I suppose, right? Uh, and finally, food that makes you confused. Food that makes me confused. Yeah, you don't get it. What's up with that? I don't, I've never thought about... What food don't you like? What's your like Achilles heel? Well, I'm 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 not the healthiest of eaters. Okay. So like I had pasta earlier. I'm gonna go eat some burgers after this. Nice. Probably some <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> yeah, some burgers. Um Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like eat ice cream all the time, cookies. So anything that's not gonna help your life in any way. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you. I support. Yeah. We all support. I don't, I just be happy. Yeah. Be what makes you feel good. There you go. Words of wisdom from the great Sydney Sweeney, everybody. Um, no, truly. I mean, look, if, if the last five years are any indication of what the next five, 10, 15, 20 and beyond are, we're in for a lot of great material. What's, what is the next five or 10 year plan? Have you written it out? Is there a PowerPoint? Oh. I'll send it to you once I get it done. Okay, fair enough. Uh, check out Immaculate. It's fantastic. She always kills it. Give it Thank up one you. more time. Thank you. For Sydney Sweeney, everybody. Thank you. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>